It's all yours. Uh, thank you, Kevin. I am Bricklayer Tom. I am an alcoholic, and I am very grateful to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Good to see my friend Richard. Kevin, it's always good to see you. And I'm right where I belong in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, Kevin said I got to talk for a whole hour. Anybody that knows me knows I probably am not going to have a problem with that. Um, but when we say that little prayer in the beginning there, mine's always the same. When I'm asked to lead or share at a meeting or asked to share my experience, strength, and hope, I always say the same prayer. God, please help me help you help someone. Um, and that kind of takes me out of the picture. And then whatever happens, happens. Uh, with your permission, I'm, before I get started, I want to read something real quick. This is uh, Everybody has their favorite stories in the big book. I got a couple of them. My favorite is Bill's story. Uh, my second favorite is the one at the uh, end of We Agnostics, the, about the preacher's son. I like that one. And then my third favorite is, it's in, the, it's in the, my third edition. It's not in the fourth edition. It's called Flower of the South. I want to read real, real quick. <clears throat> I usually have a trouble getting through this. Um, but I'll try. I wish I could tell you all that AA has done for me, all that I think and feel about AA, but it's something that I have experienced and have never been able to put into words. I know that I must work at it as long as I live. I know it is only by working at it that I can stay sober and have a happy life. It is an endless career. It has changed not simply one department of my life, it has changed my whole life. It has been a fellowship with God and man that has held good wherever I've turned and whatever I've done. It is a way of life that pays as it goes every step of the way in compensations that have been wonderfully rich and rewarding. It has made life a thousand times easier and simpler than did the endless compromises and conflicts by which I lived before. It pays daily in more harmonious relations with my fellow man in ever clearer insight into the true meaning of life and in the answering love and gratitude wherever and whenever I have been the instrument of God's will <clears throat> in the lives of others. In all these ways, I have experienced an ever-growing measure and beyond all expectations and rewards, a joy which I had never before imagined. The words of Dr. Bob and Bill were with me all the time. Dr. Bob said, love and service keep us dry. And Bill said, always we must remember that our first duty is face-to-face -face help for the alcoholic who still suffers. Dr. Bob tells about keeping it simple and not lousing it up. It's the last thing I ever heard him say. And I think there are some of us who at times try to read extra messages and complexities into the steps. To me, AA is within the reach of every alcoholic because it can be achieved in any walk of life and because the achievement is not ours but God's. I feel there is no situation too difficult, none too desperate, no unhappiness too great to be overcome in this great fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm an alcoholic. Uh, what does that mean? Um, <clears throat> well, I can tell you this. I spent a lot of time telling myself I'd rather be anything than an alcoholic, and today I'd rather be an alcoholic than anything. Honestly. Um, but what does that really mean when somebody says I'm an alcoholic? It means, well, for some reason, the more I drink, the thirstier I get. And for some reason, because of what booze does for me, I'll let it do anything to me. And it means that drinking became more important than my marriage. It became more important than my son. It became more important than my freedom, my sanity, my health, my employment, my relationship with my family. It became more important than all that stuff. But what does it really mean to be an alcoholic? It means that I suffer from an illness which only a spiritual experience will conquer. Period. Plain and simple. Now, I got to tell you, I fought that for a long time. <laughs> you know, I can sit here and tell you real quick how I got here. I drank until I couldn't drink anymore. I started when I was 13. I drank a bottle of Boone's Farm in 15 minutes, got sick as a dog, went into immediate blackout, and got, almost got thrown out of my house, and I couldn't wait to do it again. And I was 13. And for the next 20 years, every time I picked up a drink, I got drunk. Now, I didn't know that that's, I thought I got drunk because that's what I was trying to do. I thought that's what I wanted to do. I didn't understand back then that once I, because of this allergy that I apparently was born with, 
because of this allergy that once I take the first drink, I am now doomed, condemned to get drunk, whether I want to or not. I didn't know that for a long time, 15 years. But that's the truth. Because every single time I picked up a drink after that, I got drunk. I've never in my life ever picked up a drink that I didn't end up drunk. I can't. And I fought that for a long time. Until the obvious set in when, you know, after 40 WIs and jails and hospitals and car wrecks and courtrooms and busted marriage, all that shit, you know, it was time to admit that I was an alcoholic. I knew I was an alcoholic. I'm not, I'm not, I'm an alcoholic, but I'm not stupid. I, I knew I was an alcoholic. I just didn't want to be one. And I tried to prove that I wasn't. And it almost killed me. And I didn't really mind being an alcoholic, to be honest with you. There was just something about that word powerlessness that just left a bad taste in my mouth. I did not like that word being powerless. I'm a barroom brawling redneck stonemason from Carroll County, and I'm not powerless over shit. If I want something bad enough, I'll make it happen. And if you get in my way, I'll get you out of my way. I, I grew up like that. I've been like that most of my life. And it got me in a lot of trouble. I couldn't beat this. This thing beat me. So what happened was I got to a point where I really, really, really wanted to quit drinking and I found out I couldn't do it. I woke up one day and 20 years of my life was gone. I couldn't remember most of it. I missed my first son being born because I was drunk. I don't know if I'm ever going to get over that. But he's 36 now, and uh, I'll share something with you. Uh, he's 36 now, and this is the Father's Day card that he gave me last Father's Day. Uh, his name's Christopher. And this is the Father's Day card he gave me, and this is what he wrote in it. Dad, I am the man I am today because of you. My optimism and perseverance to never quit. My strong will and ability to see the solution with every problem by keeping a clear head. I am the man I am because of you. I cannot express the words of how grateful I am to call you my father. You make me feel blessed every day. I love you, Dad. Happy Father's Day, Chris. So if you want to know what AA is, that. My second son, my youngest son, is six years six years later. He went right from the doctor's hands right to mine. Because of Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, guys, I gotta tell you, I, I'll be quite honest with you. I'm not gonna get all sentimental here, but I'll tell you this, I love being an alcoholic. I, I of all the things I could have wrong with me, I'll take alcoholism because this is treatable. And the treatment for this disease gave me a brand new life. I don't mind being an alcoholic. I fought it for years. Today I'm I have no problem whatsoever being an alcoholic. I'm cool with it. The reason I'm still in AA is because I don't ever, ever want to be a drunk again. The one of the most wretched symptoms of this disease is typically the ones we love the most, the ones we care about the most, or the ones we hurt the most. It's the nature of this disease. I suffer with alcoholism. I make other people suffer from it. And that's what got me here wasn't the jails and the hospitals and the car wrecks and the, it wasn't all that shit. I'd gotten used to that stuff. It was, I couldn't stand seeing the tears in my wife's eyes anymore and the look of hurt and disappointment on my mom's face and my son shaking like a leaf because he's scared to death of his dad. That's the shit I don't ever want to see again, ever. You know, I, I come to AA to hear things I don't want to hear and to talk about stuff I don't want to talk about and to remember shit I'd rather not remember. But if I make it to November, I'll be coming up on 28 years sober in Alcoholics Anonymous. So is it worth it? Hell yes, it's worth it. It's a thousand times worth it. I would do it all over again. All the inconvenient, uncomfortable, scary, pain in the ass shit that you people told me to do when I got here that didn't make any sense didn't it wasn't logical i didn't know you people why would i listen to you 
And then one guy at the chip house one time, a guy named Gene Rappi said to me, if you're so freaking smart, what are you doing here with us? And I blurted out because you people know how to stay sober and be happy. And I don't have a clue how to do that. And whatever it is you people have, whatever people you, whatever you found, I need it. Or I'm a dead man. And I knew it. The jig was up. So here's what happened to me. I walked into a meeting in Alcoholics Anonymous in June of 1989 called the Agape Group in Baltimore. I walked up to a man and I reached out my hand and I said, will you please help me? The five hardest words I've ever said in my life <laughs> to anybody. Will you please help me? Sounds easy, doesn't it? Not if you're me. And this man, 31 years sober, took one look at me at about 30 hours sober. And he looked me right in the face. He said, son, there's not a thing in this world I can do to help you. And scared the shit out of me. I finally got enough nerve to ask somebody for help. And the first thing out of his mouth was, there's nothing I can do to help you. And then he did something very strange that people did not do to me. He walked right up to me and he poked me in the chest with his finger. And he got right in my face. Little short, bald head man with dark glasses, bad breath. He got right in my face. And he looked at me dead in the face. He said, son, if you want help, if you truly want help, I suggest you get on your damn knees and ask for it. And you better mean it. I don't care whether you believe it or not. It doesn't matter. It's not important. But you better mean it because if you don't, he'll know it. And he turned and walked away. Now, they wrote a chapter about me in the big book called The Agnostics. I had a belief in God. I've always believed in God. I'm not really sure why. I just always have. I mean, unless you're blind, I guess you got to believe there's something going on. We're never going to understand. But I never had a problem with them. Creative intelligence, the universe, spirit of the universe. I never had a problem with any of that shit, really. But I never prayed in my life because I just thought it was silly. And when that guy said that, I knew what he was saying. Six foot two, 250 pound barroom brawler and redneck stonemason get on my knees and pray. And that's when I really got scared because I'd never done that before. And I spent a lot of time on my knees drunk. It never occurred to me to ask God for help when I was down there. So I knew what he was saying. So I did what he said. Why? Because I was scared and in a lot of pain. And there was nothing else left to try. So I did what I was told, oddly enough. I went in the room and I got on my knees in a pitch black room and I said, dear God, please help me. I'm a drunk and I don't want to die this way. And I meant it. And something happened. My first spiritual experience was not the first time I got on my knees. It was when I got back up. Something was different. Nothing outside of me had changed, but something inside of me had absolutely changed. And like she said in that little reading there, I have never been able to put that into words. And I was able to not drink that day. And then I did it again the next day, and I was able to not drink that day. And I kept doing it. And I was able to not drink that day. And that's how I separated myself from alcohol long enough to come in here and ask you people, please, for the love of God, show me how to live sober because I don't have a clue what I'm doing here. I'm married. I have no idea how to be a husband. I got a two-year-old son. I don't have a clue how to be a father. I'm worried my mom to death. I have no idea how to be a decent son. So what happened was I turned my will and my life over to the care of Alcoholics Anonymous and you beautiful people. And you beautiful people taught me how to turn my will and my life over to the care of God. You handed me a big book. You said, read it like your life depends on it, because if you're an alcoholic, it absolutely does. Without the information in that book, you ain't going to make it. And they said, do you believe in God? And for some reason, yes, came out of my mouth. And they said, good, because you're going to need him, because without him, you ain't going to make it. And this is the stuff they told me right up front. The only way you could screw this up is if you try and do it by yourself, because if you could, you wouldn't be here.
my life was not unmanageable when I came here to see you people. It was unbearable. It was dire. Today, you know, I'm coming up on 28 years sober, but I'm not a first nighter. I came in 1989. I got sober again in 1995. So you can do the math. I was sober six years in here, and I found out the hard way. For anybody that's new, I found out the hard way that if you half measure this program at six years sober, you can get drunk again. If you rest on your laurels and let up on the spiritual program of action at six years sober, you can get drunk again. And probably be the last one to ever see it coming, like me. Fucking blindsided me. And the reason that happened is not because of what I was doing, it's because of what I stopped doing. At six years sober, I've made a big mistake of letting the gifts from sobriety become more important than the gift of sobriety. And I thought it was time to play catch up for pissing away 20 years of my life and have nothing to show for it. And that I should get all these shiny things that I deserve now that I'm six years sober, don't you know? And I turned my back on AA. Which ultimately led me to turn my back on God. I stopped going to meetings. I stopped calling my sponsor. I stopped working with other alcoholics. I stopped doing service work. And the nail on the coffin for me was I stopped thanking God for my sobriety. Which means now I think it's me keeping me sober. A near fatal mistake. I picked up a drink after six years sober. and Within four hours, I'm back in the jail cell with handcuffs and leg shackles on again. Within four hours after being sober six years, that's what happens when I pick up a drink. And the shame and guilt and embarrassment of that kept me out of here for eight months. I couldn't show my face in Alcoholics Anonymous. I was embarrassed. And when the pain got bad enough again, and when the fear got bad enough again, and when it got unbearable again, that was eight months of hell. Because now I know you people are here and the solution's here and I can't come back. I wouldn't wish that feeling on another human being for any reason. And when I did finally crawl back in Alcoholics Anonymous in November of 1995, the only thing you people said to me was, thank God you made it back. You didn't say what step were you working or how many meetings were you going to or when did you call your sponsor because I'd have probably smacked into them. All you said was, thank God you made it back because most people don't. And that was almost 28 years ago. So what I learned out of that, it's very simple. Without God and you people, I can't stay sober. Plain and simple. It doesn't matter how long it's been since I've had a drink. You know, the amazing thing is, even though I've been sober a little while, that's not that's not a shocker. That just proves that AA works is all that is. That's really, I don't take any credit for that. You know, the amazing thing, the, the thing that still astounds me, I have absolutely no desire whatsoever to drink. It's gone. It's been removed from me. And I didn't do that. <laughs> So any thoughts of any kind of agnosticism that I had when I first got here, I assure you, my beautiful friends, it is absolutely 100% gone. I am sober by the grace of God. I know that for a fact because he's the only one I asked. I went through the process of those 12 steps and the obsession to drink was removed from me. So I can tell you this, that even though I have screwed this up to six ways from Sunday since I've been here, the one thing I did do right was I did come back. I did make it back. And if you're new here and you have a problem with that, I'll share with you what I've learned. And I've sponsored a lot of guys since I've been here. Relapse itself is not a bad thing. Unless you kill somebody, then I guess it's bad. But relapse itself is not a bad thing. The bad thing about relapse is if you do it one time too many, you're not coming back. And you don't know when that one time too many is. You do it enough times, and one of these days you're not coming back here, and then you're screwed. And then you're in deep trouble. And uh, I only had to do it once, thank God. And I didn't have to do that. 
that was my stupidity for stop treating my alcoholism. That's what happens if I stop treating, if I stop growing along spiritual lines, that desire to drink can come back. That's why this is not a program for me anymore. It's a way of life. I'm not a big 12 and 12 guy. I can quote it to you, but I was never been, I wasn't even allowed to read it for my first year of recovery. My sponsor said it'll just confuse you. So I just, he said, the big book's going to be all you can handle for the first year. And he was right, it was. And I'm glad he did that. But I've read it a couple hundred times since then. In the very beginning, it says AA's 12 steps are a group of principles. Spiritual in nature, if practiced as a way of life, will expel the obsession to drink and allow the sufferer to, be, the sufferer to become usefully and happily whole. I did not believe that statement when I first read it. Today, I 100% totally agree with it. If this stops, and this is going to sound smart ass, and I really don't care. I've never worked the steps. I really, to be honest with you, I've never worked the steps. Because I said to my sponsor, you know, when I, I was kind of a smart ass when I got here. I know it's hard to believe, but I said to my sponsor, when do I got to work all these damn steps? He said, these steps don't need your damn work. They were worked way before you got here. They took away the stuff that doesn't work and they left for you the stuff that does. All you got to do is open the book and follow directions. Can you do that? And I said, yes. He said, good. Because that's where the program of action, that's where the program of recovery, that's where the instructions you need to treat your alcoholism are. They're not in the meetings. You're going to hear some wacky stuff when you go into meetings. If you're relying on meetings to get the information you need to treat your alcoholism, um, Good luck. But the information in that book has helped millions recover from a hopeless state of mind and body, and it can help you too if you do what that book says. I'm a big book slumper. I don't apologize for that. I, but you can blame my sponsor for that. He told me to read that book like my life depended on it, and I did. And today, if you give me a sentence out of that book, I can probably tell you what page it's on. If you don't believe me, try me. And I don't blame, I, 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 you know, I, I don't apologize for that. I've done service work at almost every level you can do in AA. I've uh, all the way up to, you know, I've never been DCM, but I've done every level of institute, hospitals, institutions, secretary, intergroup, grapevine rep. I've started meetings. I've started alcathons. I've treasured. I've done every every service position you can do in AA. But the thing that I love the most about being in this fellowship, the service, the the the, the thing that I get the most bang for my buck, my wheelhouse in AA is give me a new guy in the parking lot. You mean that new guy who's a day server, he's shitting razor blades and scared to death and pissed off and confused. Give me, give me, give me 10 minutes with that guy. The only thing I ever hope to accomplish when somebody asked me to come here and run my mouth in an AA meeting, the only thing that I ever hope to accomplish is the same thing them guys did for me 34 years ago. They all I all I want to do is make is say something hopefully that makes the brand new person sitting in this room want to come back here. If I can do that mission accomplished, because that's what them guys did for me. They this is a program of attraction, and them old timers down in Baltimore, them old street drunks that came out of the doorways over in Pratt Street and dumpsters up in Highland Town, winos. And that mean. They didn't tell me how this program worked. They showed me how this program worked. Some of these guys didn't have much but a little room over on Charles Street with a bag full of clothes and a little dog and a TV with a set of rabbit ears. And that's all they owned in their, in, their, in their world. And they were spiritual giants. You could spend hours with these guys just sitting and talking and learning from them. And they would share their lives with you, man. It was a. I miss them guys. I want to be like them when I grow up. Even though I wanted to take a swing at a few of them. They saved my life. And they cared more about saving my life than hurting my poor little sensitive feelings. I've never suffered that shit. I've worked with probably a couple hundred drunks since I've been here. It's been an honor and a privilege and a blessing in my life to be able to do that. And I've had a bunch of knuckleheads. 
But if you stick around this program, something's going to happen to you. And I'll share this with you real quick because this is this may very well happen to you. And if it does happen to you, it will change you forever like it did me. You're going to be sitting in a meeting one day and some guy's going to walk up to you. looks like shit, smells bad. He's going to reach out. He's going to say, will you help me? And you're going to say, sure, I'll try. Let's go. And then 30 days later, you see this guy walking in a meeting. He's not staring at the floor anymore. He's looking up. And he's got a smile on his face. And then six months later, you see this guy walking around. He's talking to people in the meetings. He's got a good, he's got a new job. This guy's driver's license back. And then at a year sober, you're sitting there and he calls on you. And you walk up to the front of the room and you hand him his one-year chip and you pat him on the back. And he gives you a hug and whispers in your ear, thank you for saving my life. And then his five-year-old son walks up and grabs a hold of your leg and says, thank you for giving me my daddy back. Wait till that happens to you. And it will change you forever when it does. And then you'll start to understand what we really got a hold of here. You'll start to understand what this incredible fellowship, the greatest lost and found department on planet Earth, really is. These 12 steps are not designed to get anybody sober. You got to get sober in order to do the steps. They're designed to remove the obsession to drink and connect with a power greater than you that's been blocked, that you've been blocked from your entire life, probably, like me. It'll allow you to literally start a brand new life. I only came here because I didn't want to die drunk. I hadn't, I didn't, I had no clue what I was, what I was in for. So if you're new in this fellowship, if you're new here and you're just getting started in AA, you've got no idea what you got a hold of. you got no <laughs> clue what's being offered to you. My sponsor asked me, he said, how old are you? I said, I'm 33. He said, how would you like to start your life over again at 33? I thought he was out of his friggin' mind. He wasn't. I should be dead, guys. This shit almost killed me twice. I've been through things that most people do not come out the other side still breathing. I've been shot at and stabbed. I, I fell off a four-story building, ended up with shock trauma, and they couldn't even find anything broken on me anywhere. I'm, I've been through shit that most people don't come out the other side still alive. I was found in a snowbank one time, half frozen, drunk. I mean, I'm not supposed to be here. I woke up in Big Pipe Creek in a pickup truck, half underwater, upside down. I'm not supposed to be here. And the only explanation I have for where I am today, from where I came from, is the grace of a loving God that I'm never going to understand and the patience and tolerance of the most beautiful people on planet Earth and Alcoholics Anonymous. And I've heard people say in here, I can never pay back AA what AA has given me. Well, if you really believe that, AA hasn't given you much. I've never believed that. I can offer the AA exactly what was given to me. A safe place to heal into rooms of AA with people just like you. Permission to be human again through those 12 steps. And a relationship with God by trying to help other people. And I can offer that to anybody that walks through the door. I can give back to AA what AA has given me and then some. And I intend to spend the rest of my life doing exactly that. I mean, how do you pay some, how do you pay back somebody for a brand new life? And when is it paid in full? I don't know. You can't put a price tag on this. I got a wife sitting in there on the couch right now. Hey, hi. She's in the bedroom. I got, I got a wife sitting in there. We just celebrated 46 years married. And I put that little girl through 12 years of pure hell that she did not deserve. None of it. I hurt her. Some amends are one and done. Some amends take time. That one's going to take the rest of my life. If I even have enough time left. One amends I had to make. It took me about a year to do all my amends. I had this little script I had to read. I'm an alcoholic. I'm in recovery. I'm 
I'm doing this because my life depends on it. I'm here to admit my wrongs and do anything I can to make this right. I had a little script I had to read. My sponsor gave it to me. And even though one of my amends I could have done 10 years in prison for, for brain larceny, who stole a backhoe <laughs> and sold it and got drunk for two months. And me and that guy are best friends today. <laughs> but the, the one of the amends that really stands out to me was a really small one. I'm a mason by trade. I'm a stone mason by trade. I took a, a couple hundred hours from some lady to do something for a set of steps or something. I don't remember what it was, but I went to the bar and got drunk, forgot about it. And then just completely forgot about it. And I literally forgot about it until this eight step list came up and it popped up. There it was <laughs> out of nowhere. And I went and found this lady. It took me a while to find her, but I found her. And I called her and I asked her if I'd come see her. And she said yes. And I walked up to her and we sat in her living room and I told her, I read my little script. And I handed her the 300 hours that I took from her. And I said, I'm willing to do anything to make this right. And she looked at me and she said, Tom, you can never make this right. It wasn't right when you did it. It's not right now and it will never be right. She said, but what you've done by coming here and getting honest and owning up to it is you've made it forgivable. You made it forgivable. And I left that lady's house with tears in my eyes, which is not easy to do today. And then I understood why those promises come after the ninth step. They didn't just open the book and throw them in there or anywhere. They come after that ninth step for a reason. Doing amends in our recovery program is not about receiving forgiveness or relieving our guilty conscience. It's about making room for God, just like the rest of the steps. I didn't come into AA and take these 12 steps and find God. I adopted these 12 steps as a way of life, and he found me. He, the one that was lost. I was. And the reason I love AA is because you can come in here and you can make peace with your own God in your own way and in your own time and you can call it whatever you want. And as far as I know, there's no place else you're allowed to do that. But you can in AA. You can come in here and find your own God and call it whatever you want. There's 122 different higher powers in here right now and I'm sure they all work. That's why I love Alcoholics Anonymous. Come in here and find your own. I did. I put myself, I hid from God for about 33 years. I was in a meeting the other night, and this guy's reading that, you know, they're out page 58, rarely have we seen a person fail, how it works, you know. I can recite it to you with my eyes closed, from rarely have we seen to God couldn't work with your son. At the, at the beginning, in the beginning of the meeting, this guy's reading how it works, and I'm sitting there thinking, okay. And when he got to the part where he says, there is one who has all power, that one is God, may you find him now. What I heard, I don't know if this is what he said, but what I heard was, there is one who has all power, that one is God, may he find you now. And uh, I kind of got a chill. <laughs> I don't know if that's what he actually said, but that's what I heard. And I can tell you right now, sitting here, as honest as I can possibly be, that's exactly what's happened to me. He found me. I put myself in. There's a place in the big book where we said it says we've had these deep and effective spiritual experiences, mainly because we have placed ourselves in a position to receive them. My sponsor was a former Marine, old West Virginia farm boy, two tours of duty in Vietnam, very spiritual guy, but he didn't play with me. And um, you know he's. He he asked me one time, I'm going to clean this up a little bit because he was, I mean, his language was a little salty. So he said to me one time, he said, Tom, did you ever wonder why you don't have any character defects? And I said, yeah, Wayne, why is that? He said, because you got no freaking character. The only thing defective about your character is the lack of it. All you got's an attitude and a bad one. He said, fortunately for you, there's a 12-step program here that will allow you to build some character in your life where you have absolutely none. And I'm here to report to you 28 years later that that's exactly what has happened. 
God did not remove all my character defects. He just simply removed the need to use them. I don't need them anymore. He has allowed me to practice some principles in my life that have allowed me to build some character. What do I mean by that? Well, it means I learned the difference between being married and being a husband. It means I learned the difference between having kids and being a father. It means I learned how to grow up in here. It means that every single thing that I have today worth anything came from the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous and God's grace. I don't take much credit for any of this. I really don't. All I did was I was sick enough and scared enough to show up here and ask you people for help. And you just carried the message. You shared the good news with me that there is a solution. We have one. And if you want it as bad as we wanted it, you can find it in here and we'll help you find it. And we don't ask anything in return, except when you find it, go help somebody else find it. I used to thank them guys all the time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for saying they say, man, don't thank me, bum. What the hell are you thanking me for? Pass it on. Pass it on. They preach that shit from the pass it on. Go help the new guy find what you found. If you want to keep what you have, you better go help somebody else find it or you ain't going to keep it. And I can assure you, I learned that lesson the hard way, too. So. What's the moral of this story? Those who do not recover are those who cannot or will not completely give themselves to this simple program. You hear it at every meeting. I'll say it again. Those who do not recover are those who cannot, which I've never met in 34 years, or will not, I've met hundreds, I was one of them, completely give themselves to this simple program. Folks, if you're here now, whether you're just getting here, count your blessings that you made it here. If you're coming back, thank God you made it back. But if you're here now, just completely give yourself, I mean, I'm begging you. Completely give yourself to this simple program and watch what happens. You will be absolutely amazed at the life that you can find that you never probably thought you wanted or needed or even existed in Alcoholics Anonymous. You never have to be drunk again and you never have to be alone again, ever. And whatever you did that got you here, you don't have to do that no more. However you felt when you got here, you don't have to feel like that no more. And the people that you hurt before you came here, you don't have to hurt them people no more. And you could be a decent, sober human being and a child of God. I remember saying to my sponsor one time, <laughs> I mean, literally angry. I don't know who in the hell I am. I spent, I was an imposter when I got here. I spent 20 years of my life trying to be somebody I was never supposed to be. And at the same time, hiding who I really am. And if you do that for 20 years like I did, you'll get to a point where you don't have a freaking clue who you are anymore. You look in the mirror, I have no idea who that is looking back. And I got there. And I swear to God, that's a, that I wouldn't wish that on anybody. I said to my sponsor, I don't know who the hell I am. And he, took, he looked at me, he said, I know exactly who you are. You're a child of God, and AA is going to show you how to act like one. He didn't play with me, man. And that's exactly what has happened. I'll be honest with you guys. I don't have a relationship with God. I don't have a God of my understanding. I get a headache when I try to understand God. It's a little out of my league. But it didn't take me long to understand. That he under, it didn't take me long to find out he understands me perfectly. So if you have something that ain't working the way it's supposed to, take it to the one that made it to have it fixed. It just makes sense. You know? That's what I did. I didn't turn my life over to God. I returned it. He gave it to me for 33 years. I made a complete shambles of it. And I just decided to give it back to the one who gave it to me to begin with. And my life has not been the same since. And I don't ever have to drink again. And I have a life today that I swear to God, I still sometimes wake up and think, how in the hell did I get here from where I came from? 
28 years, 28 years sober sounds like a lot. Doesn't impress me, but I'll tell you what, there's nobody in this room more shocked by that than I am. I was not expecting that when I came in here. I just didn't want to die drunk. I was not expecting to find the life I have today. I was not expecting to get the trust and the love of my family back. I was not expecting my health. I'm 68 years old. I was up on a roof today, 812 French roof in 90 degree heat, pounding shingles all day. I'm 68 friggin' years old. So being restored to sanity is questionable. So, you know. But it's what I like to do. I can still do it. Should I put my body, if I put enough booze and drugs in me in 20 years to kill 10 people? You freaking kidding me? There ain't no reason in hell why I should see me able to spell my name. But I got a great life today. I, I got two sons that think I'm their hero. I got a, a family that I, I just, my recovery is not about the things you can put your hands on. It's about the people you can put your arms around. For me, it is. One of the most precious gifts that I've gotten since I've been sober is the love and the trust of my family back. Because I found out something. And please hear me when I say this. If you spend 20 years telling people to leave you the hell alone, they all will. And then you'll regret that you ever said that. Like I did. So don't tell the people that love you to leave you the hell alone. Because you may. Unfortunately. They may hear you one day. And then you're in trouble. Because if it wasn't for that little girl sitting in there on that couch, I wouldn't be here. If it wasn't for the kindness and patience and tolerance of a bunch of complete strangers that I had nothing in common with, that I didn't like most of them, I didn't come where you came, I don't look like you, I don't sound like They said, keep coming back and we'll, we'll share with you the good news. That you can live with this disease and not die from it. Yes, alcoholism is still fatal. It still kills people every single day. That's a fact. But fortunately for us, sitting in this room right now, it doesn't have to be terminal. It's not terminal anymore. It's not a death sentence anymore. It used to be. We're blessed. We're very fortunate. I'm grateful for shit that happened before I was even born. I'm grateful that when Bill walked across that in that phone booth, he didn't stop at 10 calls. He made an 11th call and got a hold of Henrietta Cyberling, which put him in, doctor, in, in touch with Dr. Bob, which is the reason we're still here 88 years later. I'm grateful for shit that happened before I was even born. So when I say I'm grateful to be an alcoholic, what does that mean? Well, it's like the old saying in Baltimore, you know, if you're hungry and somebody gives you a sandwich, you're thankful. But if you take half of that sandwich and give it to someone else who's hungry, then you're grateful. And that's the difference between them two. I'm thankful for a lot of things. But I'm grateful for God to, I'm grateful to God to be sober. And the only way I can show that is to come in here and share that with people that are trying to get sober. What I found. And I can only tell you the same thing that they told me when I came in here. They took one look at me and said, I have no idea what's going to happen if you do this program. But I'll tell you exactly what's going to happen if you don't. And they were right. And I can only tell you the same thing. I have no idea what's going to happen if you do this program. Probably the same thing that happened to me. You'll get sober and have an amazing life. But if you're an alcoholic like I was, a chronic drunk like I was, a mean, nasty, heartless prick with no conscience, hurts people, does immoral, illegal shit that I was not raised to do, kind of drunk like I was, I can tell you exactly what's going to happen if you don't do this program. You know, the closest I ever came to knocking somebody's teeth out in Alcoholics Anonymous was a guy at the chip house named Gene Rappy. Took one look at me and he said, Tom, you're the kind of guy that if you die right now, you'd be missed by very few people for a very short period of time. And I want to kill him. Because he was right. I'm grateful to God that the people in AA told me the truth. I'm grateful to God when I reached out to that man and I said, will you please help me? He didn't say, yeah, grab a coffee, come on in, sit down, maybe this shit will rub off. He didn't say that. He said, I can't help you. The power that you need to not pick up the first drink, I can't give you. But I can tell you where to find it. 
I have family members who spent hundreds and thousands of dollars traveling the world trying to find God. I only had to go two feet. The distance from my knees to the floor. And I found out he wasn't that far away any, all, all along. Yours probably isn't either. He's probably waiting to hear from you. Or she or it or whatever you want to call it. All I can tell you is I have no idea what's going to happen to you if you try that. But if you get to where I did, where there's nothing else left to try. You know, it only takes two things to get here into this fellowship, fear and pain. But it only takes two things to stay here for a long time. And that's willingness and faith. And willingness is just doing what you don't want to do or what you're afraid to do. And faith is just doing what you're not sure is going to work. And it only takes a little bit of both of those, not much, just a little bit, mustard seed. Just enough to get in here, get your foot in the door and take a crack at these steps and reach out your hand to another alcoholic and ask for help. And I assure you, the results of this fellowship and program will carry you the rest of the way. The people in here and the program and the principles we live by, will, the results of doing that will carry you the rest of the way. This has been my experience. I am only sharing with you what happened to me. I have no idea what's going to happen to you. But I've been around AA for quite a while, and I worked with a bunch of alcoholics, and I know thousands of hopeless drunks who today are living completely different lives than the ones they came in here with, and I'm one of them. So I'm not here to get sober. I'm here to stay sober. I don't ever want to drink again. Because even after 28 years sober, I know two things are going to happen. If I pick up a drink right now, I will not be able to stop. That's never going to change. I'm an alcoholic. And I, and I, I, I got to be honest with you, the reason I don't drink is because I have no desire to drink. It's easy to stay sober when you have no desire to drink, but that's not the real reason I don't drink. Getting drunk doesn't scare me. I've never been afraid of getting drunk in my life. I'm still not. Never have been. I've never met a drunk who is, really. I was terrified to live sober. That was my problem. But the reason I don't drink, the reason I haven't had a drink in 20 years is not because I'm afraid of getting drunk. It's because I know that for whatever stupid bullshit excuse I can come up with to wrap my hand around a drink, I would have to first deny the grace of God. And that absolutely terrifies me. And I do not scare easy. That scares the crap out of me. Even the thought of that. I'm not one of those alcoholics I'm afraid if I pick up a drink, I'll die. I'm afraid if I pick up a drink, I won't die. Which would be worse for me and everybody around me. But the thought, just the thought of going back and living that godless, spiritually disconnected life again, like I had when I came in here, I'd really be dead and go back there. And I'm being very honest with you. So the reason I don't drink is not because I'm afraid I'm going to get drunk or what I'm going to do or who I'm going to hurt. The reason I don't want to drink is because I don't ever, ever want to be disconnected from God again. Because I know what will happen if I do. And I don't ever, ever, I didn't come here because I was sick of drinking. I came here because I was sick of me. And so I'm not one of those people who just needed to stop drinking. I needed a complete overhaul when I got here. I needed to have a, I needed a psychic change. I needed, a, I needed a whole new design for living. And I found one. In the rooms, in the fellowship, in the program, in the loving hands of Alcoholics Anonymous. From a bunch of complete strangers. Who had nothing more and had no other no other agenda, no other, no, no ulterior motive than to help me stay sober so they could stay sober themselves. What a beautiful fellowship we're a part of. You know, I think uh, Scott Peck, I think it's in the Sermon on the Mount or whatever. We've got two minutes left. I think it was a uh, Sermon on the Mount or one of them books. He said that there are the three most 
the three most life-changing events of the 19th century, which is like 100 years, the three most life-changing events of the ninth, of the 20th century, one was the Holocaust, two was the coming of the Third Vatican, and three was Alcoholics Anonymous. So to be a part of something like that, to be a member of the greatest fellowship on planet Earth, We have all, if you're new here, you have a whole army of sober alcoholics behind you willing to do anything to help you if you want to stay sober and not ask anything in return. And I defy anybody to find that anywhere else. It doesn't exist. At least if it has, I haven't found it. But you can walk into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, wherever you come from, whatever you taught, however you raised, whatever you did, whatever you look like. And you can find a new home and a new family and a new life. And those are just the facts. And I am very, very grateful that I found it or that you found me. And I'm going to do everything in my power to try to pass that on and be, you know, and I'll end with this. If I drop dead tomorrow, there's only three things I want on my tombstone. He was a good dad. He was a good husband and a trusted servant. And if I can make them three things happen before I check out of here, mission accomplished. Thank you, God. And thank you, beautiful people.